Madam Clerk, if you would. Yep. Trustee Porter? Here. Trustee Bancoli? Here. Trustee Preggy? Here. Trustee Husani? Here. Trustee Gutierrez? Here. And Trustee Kemper is absent. Thank you. And uh, we have a motion to accept the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Christy, if you would call the roll. Uh, trustee, uh, sorry, Bancoli? Uh, yes. Trustee Preggy? Yes. Trustee Husani? Yes. Trustee Gutierrez? Yes. And Trustee Porter? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, discussion of items. So on the capital budget, Juliana, you have the floor. If you can put the microphone just a little bit closer, I think that would help. Thank you. So, uh, because they are, um, they may be jumping around the department head when they come up, will uh, guide you to the page number that the project that they are referring to is on. And so we will, there are page numbers on each of the pages so that you can uh, reference that section. There is not a PowerPoint presentation this evening, uh, so we will be referring to the documents that are in front of you. Uh, there's no additional. So we're going to begin with information technology. Jed. Good evening. Good evening. Does everybody have the document pulled up on their screen? Okay, we're, I'm gonna start on page 24 of that document. 24? 24. I went to 44. <clears throat> oh, good. I have one project that's in the general fund capital, so that's what I'm gonna touch on first. 24? 24. So the first project is a document management system. This will be a village-wide document management system. Um, the cost for this is, a, will, is budgeted to be $155,600. Um, <clears throat> what this will accomplish, uh, it'll, it'll be a multi-year project to implement, um, but we want, we, we for several <coughs> years have been talking about collecting all the documents into one system. Everybody accesses the same documents from the same system. Um, so this will touch every department in the village uh, for all the records. Uh, we're starting this up. I'll be leading the project, but every department will be uh, one, one B on this. Um, so some of the types of records, just to point out, clerk's records, parcel records, transfer stamp uh, records, business licenses, uh, all the records that are um, attachments to our New World ERP system, um, police records, uh, some, some of those down the line, uh, fire records, uh, you name it, human resources, employee records. Um, so it'll be a, a challenging project over two or three years, uh, but we're excited about it. So if you change, now move forward to page 44, we'll go to the next project. Before we go on, uh, oh, yes, I have a question. The um, protection of you know, we hear a number of uh, municipalities have been hit with uh, these uh, people that come in and attack. Uh, do we have adequate uh, prevention on the front end of this management system? Absolutely, Mayor. So we have uh, a very robust cyber security um, uh, management system now with several different products, and this will just uh, become a part of our, our overall system. What type of insurance do we have to protect us against ransomware or that type of attack? So we do have some uh, cyber, uh, cyber incident insurance through IRMA, and I, I would think that we would probably talk about that 
offline. We can send that information to you if you'd like. Okay. Just with the, with so, some of some people may have read, you know, or all of us have probably read that having cyber insurance, cyber incident insurance, makes us a target for attack because uh, the bad actors think that they have we have the ability to pay. So we have. We do have insurance, but we have a lot of other mechanisms before we would get to the point where we would even consider using that to pay a ransom, if it was a ransomware event. Um, we, have s we have several different routes of our data to recover that we've implemented over the last uh, four years. I think um, also for this uh, document management system, it should be noted that these documents are all in our system. They're just in different places. Right. And in file cabinets, et cetera. So this is a way. This is a way to um, organize it, have one location, and have everybody be able to find documents rather than spending two hours in the basement trying to find one. <laughs> I look at the clerk. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Do they do they do all the scanning and stuff? Yeah. So uh, existing records. So the part of the first part of the process, we just. Uh, uh, talked about this at a department head meeting recently. The first part of the process is everybody to identify all the records they keep in their department. And then once we get that, and that's gonna be a very, very long list. Um, so we'll, we'll create an index of all, all the different records that are stored, and then we're gonna prioritize which records should be scanned into the system first. And it's likely that in future years we'll be um, requesting budget to continue scanning. So many villages, have a first year a, a, a larger dollar amount to get a system up and running, get the most important records that in the system right away, and then they budget a certain amount, amount of money to continue to get those historical records. Any new records will go into the system from day one. Each department, the old ones, each department decide when they want to start or uh, for the old records that are I think collectively we'll decide. I think it'll be a collective decision between all the department heads. Um, once we have a comprehensive list of all the documents from the departments, which ones are most important to get digitized first. It sounds like a massive amount of information. Uh, is there a budget to cover? Would it require, first of all, would it require any additional staffing to do the data entry to, to accomplish this, or will you be able to, comp to achieve this with the current levels of staffing? Uh, so as Trustee Gutierrez uh, said, um, we're going to have a service scan the records that we identify in the first year, so it won't have an impact on staffing, and we won't be asking for more staff at this time for that. Um, but the the day-to-day -day routine of new records, it'll just become a part of everybody's routine to, mm -hmm. they work on something, they scan it in. Yeah. Yes. Correct. No, no, this it's part of this line item. So it's within the 150. Correct. Okay. Okay. And then so we would pay 155 up front and then every year after pay So the fifteen thousand would be a an operational um, amount for the software support and maintenance. And so when there's new versions of software, if we have issues with the software, it's technical support. Um, annually, and that would go into the IT operational budget. So it's dependent on updates. It's not just a flat 15 grand that we're paying every year. No, it is. It would be. Um, it would be a, a, an exact dollar amount of, uh, for maintenance, maintenance each year, um, and that would probably go up each year by a, give or take five percent. Generally, software maintenance goes up three to five percent each year. So throughout the, when we get to the budget process, you'll see that a lot, most of our software is on a subscription base or maintenance base now, so that we have, um, in a lot of cases, we pay an annual uh, uh, fee for each of those uh, software pack, uh, Correct. services. In addition to that 15 though, and in addition to this 155, we're not sure how much uh, and how many records this will get us through. So that you will most likely see next year a capital request for I, an unknown amount i don't know what it is for the next batch of records and maybe it'll depend on how well we're balancing the budget to see how much we're going to choose to do each year after that so this is the initial 
we're going to prioritize which departments records uh, are used the most throughout the organization and start there and then work our way down. Correct. Yes. So within the Thank you. Sorry. It's okay. Um, and then my second question is, would we technically now, and, and I don't know if we already have this classification, but um, deem our village either paperless or a, a green village? Would that, would that allow uh, us we, to have we, that? We are not there? paperless at this point, but this is a, a, a big step to, towards that for okay. sure. Yes. So this, so this would not allow us to become paperless if, if we are essentially digitizing everything and centralizing everything. We, we would not then be deemed a, a paperless. I mean, it, it can, but it will take several years before that, before we're able to get to every department. Um, I think that, I mean, we're gonna have more than a thousand types of records, that would be my guess off the top of my head mm -hmm. that we're looking at, and then we have, um, you know, some of the different ways that we have the storage of the records, some are already digitized, uh, some are on microfiche, microfilm, um, some are in boxes throughout the di different departments, uh, some are stapled, some are, you know, filed differently. So all of that work is what we're trying to get, bring together um, initially, uh, but that's gonna take time. Okay, would we be able just to, I, I mean, it, it seems like going paperless and digitizing everything would maybe go hand in hand. So would we would be able to see if this process is something that will allow us to yeah. then claim that title? Sure, absolutely, okay. yeah. Oh, thank you. And you know, that, that would be something to bring up in the strategic planning workshops that we'll be doing in the future too, to make sure we're, you know, that's a path the board wants us to, to take. Um, Very good. <coughs> Page 44. Any other questions on that? Oh, okay, so page 44. So this is the IT equipment replacement fund that we started funding in 2015. Um, the first item on here is our voice router replacement. Uh, to be able to make and receive phone calls outside of the village buildings, we have voice routers, um, four of them in total, and they are reaching end of life at the end of 22, so this is a routine budget item where we're going to replace that equipment. Any questions on that? So the next item down just below that, um, Fire Station 1 audio video replacement. In the Fire Station um, training room in the basement, they have a 15 plus year old system that has been failing um, <clears throat> for several years. This is an item that we did budget for in 2020, but when the pandemic started, this was something that we decided not to, to, uh, to complete last year, so we're rebudgeting for it this year. Any questions on that? Okay. So page 45, <clears throat> we have our internet firewall replacement. So we have two firewalls to, to work uh, redundantly, so if one fails, the other one will take over automatically. Um, those are also reaching end of life next year and at the end of August. Um, so it's very important that we don't let the protection we have between our network and the internet uh, go end of life. So we're budgeting to replace those next year. <coughs> Any questions on those? Um, yes. So because the board hasn't had a chance to read the document mm -hmm. in front, um, can we maybe have Fire talk about their um, training room sure. item, just, it's $70,000. So. Chief? <laughs> Go ahead. Good evening. So just a little bit of background. Um, the station one, this is our headquarters station. This training room is pretty much our entire basement. It uh, is able to seat over 100 people. We've uh, regularly over the years hosted many different versions of classes. It's much more than just a training room for our on-duty staff that work out of that station. We also hold regional training. We've hold, we have held in the past international training, hazmat classes with 
uh, members from Hong Kong visiting us actually for a week long, two week long classes. Uh, and we need to update this, this room, but also uh, basically go through an entire redevelopment and, and redesign of integrating it with other village systems to be able to be more remote. Obviously, as we learned in the last year, how critical that is. This also allows us to integrate uh, training virtually between stations and inspectional services here at the village campus. So uh, in other words, that those engine and ambulance companies on the south side of our town stay in the south side where they're closer to their response area while still being able to contribute through training. And we do that with this AV system in this room. So we're re really looking forward to this purchase. Chief, with, with the uh, expense of um, making this connectivity to the south side station now and with the plans for the new fire station how do, how do we justify those expenses for putting the expense into that existing structure which we know is obsolete and will soon be replaced with the new and upcoming structure and then any costs that will be associated with making that connection to, to the system Sure. None of the purchase of this uh, planned capital expenditure will go into anything that is going to be done at current station 16 or the Southside Fire Station. Okay. This is strictly infrastructure and needed uh, equipment at station 1 or station 15. Mm -hmm. And then Judd has talked and we've, we've built this into the design that it will integrate with anything here at the village currently as well as anything that we plan to build into the new station. And it's perfect timing because we'll be designing both at the same time. Okay. So there's no redundancy in, in doing this? Okay. No, sir. No. Good question. Sure. It, right, it, this also reaches out to our neighbors as well as anyone else regionally or, like I said, internationally. But we've held those classes, and this does help in that, in, in, those, in, in all of those aspects. Hold them virtually and, and okay. we, right in the past we've held some very unique classes that we've been the only ones to host in the area and that does bring in revenue from from class and, and participants okay thank you <clears throat> I like those two words generate revenue <laughs> I I'd just like to add trustee Porter um, so we already have connectivity to the South Fire Station mm -hmm. Um, via uh, fiber optic lease line through Comcast. So whatever integration that happens would use that line. There wouldn't okay. be any additional connectivity okay. needed. All right. Okay. So you use the existing lines Correct. to go to the south side station and it's going to be built into the plan for the new station. Correct. And much like this room is very adaptable now that we've added some things into this room, that's what we're trying to accomplish okay. also at the fire station. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Um, so I'll just touch on the firewalls again if anybody has any questions on the firewall replacement. Correct. Internet firewall. Next. So the next two items are um, re replacement of the police and fire mobile data terminals. These are the computers that are in the, the vehicles that are in service 24 hours a day. Um, so this is just continuing our plan, which we shifted to a four-year uh, life cycle last year. Um, so that's been working out well, and we're going to continue the four-year replacement cycle um, going forward. Um, we'll have eight replacements in the police department and four in um, the fire department. Any questions? The fire department must be a lot more expensive. If I'm reading this right, uh, the fire department. It, it, well, we, I budget five thousand dollars per machine. Okay. And that includes any peripherals that are needed when we replace. <clears throat> Moving on. Page forty-six, um, the annual PC replacements. This is also on a four-year um, life cycle. So we've replaced about, uh, or we've replaced twenty-five percent of our computers and laptops uh, every year. So we would like to continue that next year. Any questions about that replacement? Okay. These are uh, sole source type? 
Uh, we do uh, um, by Dell computers. Um, so actually probably the next board meeting I'm going to have this year's purchase on the agenda and it will be sole source. And the reason that Dell is sole source is because we buy directly from Dell. So I can't get other vendors like Insight who's in town who we do purchase uh, computer equipment from. They, they won't even take the time to quote because they know Dell is going to be less expensive direct. So essentially Dell undercuts their resellers. <clears throat> okay, so the last item for the IT equipment replacement plan is just the second year uh, payment for the police department video evidence system that was approved in September. Um, so that was a five-year agreement, uh, and we're budgeting to, for the each year two through five to be out of the equipment replacement fund. So this is the body cams? Body cams, in-car cameras, and interview room um, system at, at the police department. Okay. Any questions? So we are committed to 84000 a year? Yes. For five years? Well, the first year was... Um, 133,000 and year two through five, 84,800 is what was on the, um, in the agreement. So, so that tells me we, we're budgeted 132,000 for this year. Yes. Right, and we're implementing this year. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, check with the team. Are we doing it? We yeah. still have some of this year left. I know it's already the end of September, but yeah. Does, I know one of the, um, the things with the uh, body cameras was the storage of, of, of the data. Is that included in this cost? It is, yes. Okay. Okay. No further questions. We'll go to the next person on the agenda. Good evening, everyone. So take you through the police department capital items. We'll start on page 27. And the first item is the DUCOM second facility for the new board members. DUCOM is our dispatch agency, as you may recall. They are based in Wheaton. In 2019, they moved out of their old facility in Glendale Heights. They built a new facility in, down in Wheaton at the government center there off County Farm. They share that building with ETSB and DuPage County Homeland Security. We do pay an annual fee to help finance that building. Um, which is about $35,000 a year. So this is our third year of paying and we have to pay that through 2030. So you'll be seeing that annually. Another annual cost of the next item is on page 28. It's our DUGIS or our records management system. This again, we've paid for the last three years. This is the our records management system at the PD. That's uh, all of our police reports and any documents associated with police reports. CAD information, which is dispatch information. This captures all of our data or our calls for service and police reports for the police department. Um, it is a countywide system. Every municipality in DuPage participates in this system with the exception of two or three towns. And this is run by ETSB. They, they uh, manage the system for us and we just pay a fee to use the system. And uh, again, that is about uh, $75,000 per year, anywhere from $75,000 to $85,000. It's $85,000 this year. And we have an agreement that runs through 2023. So for over the six years, we'll pay a total of $560,000 for the use of that system. And we're in year four right now. Chief, how do we integrate with Cook County? I see we have a very, seems like very developed system for DuPage County. How do we integrate our information and our systems with Cook County? So this, this allows, this doesn't have any effect on Cook County. It's not like their residents don't <clears throat> receive the same services. This is just how we house our records and get our information from DUCOM. Uh, we still have systems with Cook County that allows us to transmit reports and stuff to Cook County courts. Um, but this system is based in DuPage, but it serves both counties. So it has no impact on service to whether you're in Cook County or DuPage County. Okay, and so we're still able to access records from Cook County State's Attorney or the Cook County Police or, or any agency in Cook County would stay still able to access that information. We would have to call them for that. They don't have Cook County does not have a system like this as mm -hmm. um, advanced as DuPage's. DuPage's allows us to get records from the court, from probation departments, right. everything in DuPage County right. in the court we could access. That does not a system like that does not exist in Cook County. Okay. There's some several different systems out there depending what you want to get, um, but there's nothing 
like this system in Cook County. All right. So. I continue with Dugis. The next item is on page 28, Dugis interfaces. So I talked about the Dugis is our primary records management system, and they do provide a records management system, but we have a lot of our own databases and programs in-house, such as the Beast, which allows us to electronically log our evidence, DACRA, which is our electronic ticketing system, and then LiveScan, which is our fingerprint machine. We do have to integrate those, those different uh, programs or machines with our records management system, and there's a cost for that of $65,000. So that is what we have budgeted next year um, so we can get those interfaces hooked up to our records management system and everything feeds into there and they can all talk to each other. We have the beast. It's a, it logs all of our evidence. We collect all of our evidence and then we log it into the system. And then that system will be able to talk to our records management and populate all of our evidence information into the records management system. Right, fingerprint. Obviously, anybody that we arrest, we fingerprint, and we get all of their information, our criminal history, and stuff like that. When they're fingerprinted, it'll take their information and populate the case that they're being fingerprinted for, so that all that information feeds in the records management system. Then the last one I mentioned was DACRA. That is our in-car electronic ticketing system. So, you know, we've gone away from the handwritten's and everything is done electronically. And again, that information will be taken out of DACRA and populated into our records management system so we don't have to enter everything, you know, two or three times. <laughs> Anything so. to make the clerk happy. Thank you. Yeah, right? Yeah, their, their handwriting wasn't always perfect. <laughs> Very true. The next item is the building distribution antenna or BDA and that's on page 28 and that's a $12,000 purchase. Uh, this just allows our radios in the PD to work, to get out so you can, uh, dispatch can understand us and other officers can hear us on the radio. We have some fortified places in our PD, our jail lockup. It's very difficult to get a radio signal out of there and down in our basement and in our EOC, it's difficult to get a signal out. So this BDA just amplifies the signal and allows it to get out so officers can be heard and communicate. The current BDA that is in there was the original one that was built with the police department back in 2010. And it's currently, they don't maintain it anymore. The parts are obsolete and they won't service it anymore. So we need to get that replaced um, and $12,000 will get us a new one. It'll hopefully last us another 10 years. Moving on, the next item is protective vests and that's on page 29. And the amount on that one is for 10,500. Every year, uh, we, this is a budgeted item every year that we uh, have to replace vests for all, some active officers that have been with us. Vests are only good for five years, the ballistic vests that officers wear. So every five years, we replace those vests. And then we anticipate how many new vests we'll need for the next year. We try and guess how many retirements there's gonna be if somebody's leaving. Um, and next year, we're anticipating needing 10 vests total. Um, so we've got 10,500 on there. Uh, to pay for those vests. Uh, one thing that's nice about the vests though is we do get a grant annually. It's a federal grant where we are reimbursed 50% of all vests that we purchase. So of that 10,500, we can expect half of that to come back. Very good. It's a B Bureau of Justice grant, vest grants, vest <coughs> replacement grants on, along those lines. Right. I'm sorry. So my question was, uh, what is the name of the grant? Okay. Again. Thank you. We're good. Next item for the police department is on page 29, and it's the Starcom radios for the amount of 221,000. The we need it's time for us to replace our police radios. And when I say police radios, most of this cost I'm talking about is the individual radio that officers carry on their hip. Uh, the current radios we have. Uh, been, we've had them since 2012. Obviously, in the nine years, technology has changed a lot. That's a long time in the technology world. So they're moving away from those. They're no longer supported by Motorola. So we are partnering with the ETSB and, again, numerous DuPage County agencies. We're all going in together, and we'll be purchasing new radios. Now, the, this cost is only for non-sworn officers. ETSB picks up the price for sworn officers, they will pay for those radios, but they will not pay for non-sworn officers. And they will not pay for what we call mobile radios. Those are 
not the ones that go on the hip, but that go in certain vehicles that allow you to talk um, to people with the portable radio. So um, our cost for that, again, is $221,000. Um, it's unknown. ETSB may allow us to div uh, divide the cost up over two years, but that's not certain yet, so we've budgeted the full amount for this year, and we're hoping to go live with the radios um, in 2023, purchase them next year, go live in 2023. So is that the difference between the 221 and the 330? thousand on this report no oh. so so everybody's getting new radios so this 221 is the police portion of it uh, fire is 86,700 and public works is 23,000 is that going to show up in their reports or I, I'm sure they'll mention them but they're all part of that 330,770 okay I see down at the bottom Right, continuing on the next item on page 30 is the use of force training simulator for forty thousand dollars this is a new training uh, purchase that we want to make there's been a lot of talk in the last year about police departments and their use of force de-escalation tactics shoot don't shoot scenarios um, this training simulator i don't know some of you may have seen it this is where you have a large movie screen and they can put different scenarios on the screen and you use your real firearm. You, obviously, it's not loaded with real ammo. It's a laser that's put on it. Uh, you could use a taser, and you're put through different scenarios. And the idea is they try and make it as lifelike as possible. You know, you can never recreate real life, right? But this um, this, tr this training system does a good job of, um, you know, stressing officers as they go through it. And then, as I said, they make them make split decisions on what kind of force to use. Um, there's a lot of de-escalation scenarios where if they use proper de-escalation tactics, then they don't have to use any force. Uh, so uh, this will be a nice purchase. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm sure everybody's heard they just passed the Safety Act, um, which requires officers to go through 12 hours of use of force live scenario training, which is very difficult for someone to do that doesn't have a system like this, because how do you do live scenario? You know, you need multiple people, and that's a lot of resources. This will satisfy that requirement. So we can put this screen up there. We can put our officers through this training, um, you know, the 12 hours a year and satisfy that mandate. And it's just really superior training to anything we've probably ever had in the police department when it comes to use of force training. So um, there's $40,000 for that. Any questions on that one? Where would, you, where would this go? Where would you put this? It's going to be down in our EOC. Okay. And it could be taken, put up and taken down. It's okay. not that difficult. So it's, so it's, it's mobile. Yeah, right. So. so we will keep this simulator. It's not like a rental or anything? Right. It, it'll be ours to keep. And, okay. And this simu simulator that we're using um, is, and I don't know if you would know this, but are other municipalities also getting this simulator, or will it be like we are the only one in the area that will have something, this, this type of technology? Elgin has one. That is the only other one in the area that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, so this isn't like a multi-jurisdictional where we share it or something like that. Um, you know, this is ours to use as we see fit when we want, and we take care of it, and you know, it's it's ours. Okay, so we wouldn't so. share it with, like, similar to um, what Chief Forbes was saying, how in some instances we use the, the space of the fire department. We would not share this with anyone else. It would, would just be ours. Correct. I would say that we would never let somebody come in if they requested, but I would not loan it out to somebody where it leaves our possession. Um, I don't know with a piece of equipment that's expensive. I'd rather have us have control of it than giving it out to people and getting it back. You know, and, and there's a significant amount of training like to set up. And you, so it's not going to be installed, like you can like physically take it out. Yes. Um, yeah, you could set it up, take it, put it up. Put it, yeah. In our discussions during the budget um, meetings, it was my understanding also that the chief said it would be utilized. There would be very little downtime just with our usage of it. Okay. Correct. So there's so many hours that they need, and by the time you run everyone through it, there's gonna be very little time for others. Is that correct? Correct. Again, every officer has to have 12 hours of this training. We have 61 sworn officers, so just doing the math there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, yeah, I don't foresee us being able to give it out to other agencies to let them use nor would I want to, quite frankly. You might not have the answer to this question, but with this training, uh, does an aspect of this training take race into, into this, this stimulator? Is, is race a component? 
I don't know. I, I, I don't know is the answer. I don't think so. Um, you know, a lot of it just has to do with the officer's ability to de-escalate, and then, um, so I don't know that race factors into it at all. Um, Would you be able I, to find out? Maybe sure. Maybe? Okay. I can find out. Thank you. My, my recollection from the one that you borrowed, though, the individual characters in the, in the different scenarios were of varying race and race background. Yeah, as you watch the scenarios unfold, you know, they've got witnesses, you've got offenders, you've got fellow officers, and they're of mixed races and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if that's what you were asking, but... Um, well, that, that could be an aspect of it, but I'm, I'm just trying to figure out if, if it has any type of um, bias training, you know, with, within this simulator. Because um, if, if it is, you know, real-life experience, and this is a, a, a diverse area, I can imagine that our officers might encounter people of different races and right. you know we all know we have our own biases so that's what I was just trying to figure out if, if they if, if that is an aspect of, of the training and I know you might not have that answer so yeah I'm just not sure how you would do that with that with the machine but um, yeah I don't know I can find out for you though okay. thank you so. And then moving on, the final item for the police department is the conducted electrical weapons, or what everybody probably refers to as tasers. Uh, our officers do carry tasers, and they are at the end of their life. They were originally purchased in 2014, and at the time we got a five-year warranty. That warranty is well past, and during that five-year warranty, every one of those broke down and has been re was replaced. Um, and by replaced, I mean they gave you new ones. Um, they don't fix them and send them back, but. They are breaking down now and we need to purchase new ones. So the $21,000 budgeted for tasers will get us 11 new tasers that will be checked out at the beginning of each shift. Every officer as well as our SAW guys and the sergeant on duty carry a taser um, while they're on patrol. Did we, is, is there just one vendor that provides these tasers or did we put something out for bid from different vendors uh, as we try to source these? These are made by Axon, who you may know is that's gonna, who's going to be our body cameras, as well as uh, the project that Jed just talked about. Um, you know, our body, they're going to be our body camera vendor, as well as our interview room vendor and our in-car camera vendor. So all of these items, will talk, all of them will talk to each other. You know, the tasers will interact with our body cameras. Um, when we looked at the tasers five years or in 2014 when we implemented them, Axon is by far the leader in the industry. Um, so the, our intent is to go with Axon again since of all of our other things that we're purchasing are Axon. Um, but when it comes to quality and the market, the Axon is the leader by far. The reason I ask is because I look at the incident of breakdowns, replacements, and repairs. Uh, and, and so I'm assuming that you've done your due, due, due diligence and that Axon is probably the, the more reputable producer of, of this equipment since we're integrating other systems with them that, you know, they're maybe, or maybe I shouldn't answer the question for you, are they the most reliable source for providing this type of equipment? Absolutely, they are the giant in the industry and their warranty during that five years, I said, they didn't repair your taser and give it back to you. They gave you new tasers. Okay. Um, you know, their customer service, I would say, is probably second to none. Okay. Um, and they've been reliable for us. Um, you know, for these the last eight or nine years, you know, keep in mind these tasers went out every day with the officers for eight years on their hips and they do get banged around and knocked around and um, we're extremely happy with you know, okay. the product that we used the last eight years. All right, thank you. So, so that is my last item, unless there's any questions. I have a question. Hi. Sure. Um, so did, did we ever discuss in the budget or look at um, some sort of equipment distribution system? I know we had, just, had asked about it because I saw that that's being done still the old fashioned way and we write it down and I know it takes time. Um, we did, uh, I had a discussion with that with uh, uh, IT Director Gerstein about the check and some money to check out the equipment electronically. My understanding is it's part of the process, right? Uh, yeah, so we're budgeting uh, in the operational budget to um, get scheduling software that also uh, allows logging of all the different equipment the police officers uh, check out each day. So electronic logging, I believe it's paper logging that you do now, right? Yeah, we've yeah. got about seven different books that they have to manually check out equipment. We write it in there. And this new system allows a barcode where it's just a couple of okay. beeps and it, it checks out four pieces, five pieces of equipment at a time. 
which makes it much more efficient. It's officers still, can get on the street faster. Right. Yeah. It's still in the budget. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the budget. Yeah. All right. That's I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. A different section. <laughs> yeah. That's why I was curious. About you. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next. Fire. Hello, everyone. Hello. We're going to start on page 25. So we have five items plus our Starcom radios we can touch on very quickly at the end. Our first item is going to be our structural firefighting uh, protective gear. Uh, that item uh, we're proposing for $56,150. That would purchase us 12 uh, complete sets or ensembles of the protective gear that this is our main structural firefighting gear that we wear when we go into fires. Every year, this is an annual purchase that we plan for. Uh, this, every firefighter is, uh, is, is given two sets of gear, and that's so that after a structure fire, or after they're exposed to the carcinogens that we get exposed to, they're able to quickly get out of that gear and that gets laundered and they have a second set to wear. So this is, this is an annual purchase for that. We still launder our own? Absolutely. This purchase actually does include what we started something, a program uh, within the last two years, which is actually a warranty program that we get included with this price per gear, where uh, twice a year it actually goes for an advanced inspection and cleaning by the manufacturer. And this manufacturer that we've begun to purchase their gear, they're the only ones that offers that service. So they're in line with price with everyone else and they offer that service. This is our best, most good use of that money that we've, that we've been able to find. We're very happy with their service. Chief, is, is there special equipment that we use to launder, launder this? I mean, it's not like your Whirlpool yeah. washing machine. Right. I mean, there's special right. equipment that yep. we use to do that, right? Each station is called an extractor. It's a specific type of washing machine that uh, the way that it tosses and, and, and turns as well as it has different uh, programming for a specific type of soap that has to be used in order to maintain the integrity of that gear to get the carcinogens out as well as specific procedures and how we separate the shells from the liners and then how we dry it. It's all equipment that's installed in each fire station. Now, is the upkeep and maintenance of that equipment included in this or is that somewhere else in the budget? That's an ongoing uh, infrastructure cost that we have through buildings and grounds. Okay. Yep. I recall those uh, machines are quite expensive. Yeah, they can be. Yep. I, ch I choke and puke every time we have to replace one. Yeah, that we, we get them with the station, though, so <laughs> it'll be okay. No, no that's all good. Uh, any other questions? We can move on. Move Next on. is going to be hybrid gear. This is hybrid protective turnout gear. This is for eight ensembles, the cost of $9,500. Uh, for new board members, uh, to update you guys, uh, we've been part of some strategic studies over the years. Chief Haig was the leader in this, in this area for heat stress studies, uh, both with uh, the University of Illinois Champaign and then Skidmore College in New York. And uh, we've been published on these studies and a lot of this work has come to find the actual uh, stress, heat stress and impact of the work that we do on the firefighter's physiological body, right? So we identified that outside of our turnout gear, which is needed for structural fires, it's very insulated and it keeps and it traps that heat. If we can go to this different set of gear when we're on car accidents or other emergencies that we don't need the thermal protection of that turnout gear, that can decrease the likelihood of cardiovascular events in our firefighters. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a numerous years, we've been also issuing a piece of this hybrid protective gear to each firefighter. And that's, again, an annual purchase mm -hmm. that goes into uh, to, to replace the, the gear that's coming out of service and all gear that comes out before we purchase new is inspected and we ensure that it needs to come out of service before we just purchase a new set. But that's what this line item is. Very good, next. Next is gonna be bifa biphasic cardiac monitor in the amount of $36,100. This is a price for one monitor. This is the main piece of advanced life support equipment that goes on an ambulance that we have on all of our ALS equipped vehicles, which also includes the engines and the tower company, as well as at, at the treatment room that we have at fire station number one. Uh, this is the core of uh, that, that monitoring and medical monitoring that does the life pack 12, does the 12 lead. It does blood pressure, SpO2. It takes those pictures. We can send that uh, information to the hospital ahead of time. And then it's the ongoing uh, monitoring while, while we're in patient care for that advanced life support patient. Uh, 
Uh, this will replace one, uh, the, our oldest uh, unit from 2010, which is coming uh, upon expiration of our warranty with that unit, so it has to be replaced. Worked like my new Apple Watch, right? Yeah, much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then moving on to the next item, a Lucas Mechanical CPR device in the amount of $17,700. Again, this is for one device. This is an automated CPR device. Uh, some background, in, in the course of a, uh, a cardiac arrest emergency, there's over 1,000 compressions that can be done in two minute intervals uh, continuously, as long as there's no heartbeat for the patient. And this device mechanically does it, so it's a machine that sits on top of them and actually does the compression to the exact right de depth and weight based on actually the patient's resistance of their chest wall cavity. And uh, it's a critical piece in, in, those, in those scenarios. Uh, we have six of them currently. This is gonna increase uh, so that we can get another one and rate uh, to another ambulance company that we currently don't have this piece of equipment on. Very good. Next is the severe weather outdoor warning sirens. So this is uh, for the price of $39,900. This is gonna purchase two uh, severe weather outdoor sirens. The village as a whole, we operate six. These are the sirens that go off in the event of severe weather, tornado, or an actual natural disaster or imminent threat on our village. These are the things that would uh, warn anyone outside is what the design is for. Uh, we have noted that the, there's two uh, that we want to attempt to, to replace. Those were both installed in the 1980s. They have a life expectancy of 20 to 25 years by the manufacturer, so they're doing well. They're over 40 years old though and we, we want to decrease that chance of failure by replacing both of them this year. And then finally, our piece to the item that Chief Minot already has brought forward is the Starcom radio purchase. Fire department operates on the same radio system through DUCOM that the police department does as well. We use it a little bit differently because obviously how we're operationally set. Uh, ETSB has noted that they don't believe that their funding is going to be able to legally be able to purchase more than one uh, radio for a vehicle or for a firefighter. And the way we run operationally, we run on two radio channels when we set up our command post. So this money, in uh, our amount is 86700 of that total uh, line item. And that would be to, to purchase three additional sets of radios and equipment and accessories for our command vehicles that we need to function. I like what we do. So do I. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is there any other questions about my items this evening? Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Very good. Public Works. Good evening. Um, I have a lot of items, so I'm going to be moving quickly just to be respectful of everybody's time. So please feel free to shout out if you have a question, because I'm going to kind of roll. Um, just tell me what page to go to. Well, we're going we're gonna to bounce around a little bit. We're going to okay. start on page 20. I'm going to mostly be working off of the, the sheet that's towards the front of the checklist. Um, so the very first item you're going to see on there on page 20 is the uh, new fire station number 16 construction. Uh, that is a total of $6 million. That is the anticipated construction cost. Uh, we have visited other stations. We have reason to believe that that is a reasonable amount uh, at the possibly even the next board meeting. We're gonna have a, we're gonna have for the board's approval a contract with a design builder to begin the process so that uh, hopefully early next year we're breaking ground. That is the intent. Uh, so in the budget, when you see the full budget, uh, you will see that the, co the total cost uh, for this capital project will be paid for from fund balance uh, in the general fund. And is that to, um, is that to um, rehab the building or to completely start over? No, this is a uh, new facility in a new location. Okay. Uh, that was one of the challenges of the existing station is it doesn't meet the needs of the community quite as well where it currently is. It's great for uh, Carroll Stream. Uh, it's probably less good for us. So uh, we have a new location. It's property the village already owns. We're actually in a very good position. It's right next to the library down there. 
on the news Park? station will be next to the library on Sonia Brand. On Chick. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Sonia Cross. Okay. Yeah. So we, we already own property right there. Okay. So we don't have to purchase anything. That, that's a huge blessing for us to discover that we had actually property that we owned that we could build on. It saves us a lot of money. Uh, we does. were looking at, it, at the uh, landfill, and that was going like nowhere. So the fact that, I don't know. It's amazing do. what GIS can do when you say, show me all vacant property in town that's this big, and we see these blocks, and we're like, oh, <laughs> a fire station will fit right there. That, that's a beautiful thing. And the fact that we can uh, use fund balance, to me, that's a key component, uh, given the fact that we don't have to put raise taxes for a bond. And if we can help our residents on that pathway, I think uh, that, that's exciting for me because a $6 million bond is, raise, can raise taxes somewhat that we try to avoid. But we have the fund balances. We got to keep this under budget, uh, the $6 million, and hopefully uh, the fire chief will help us do that. <laughs> is that the is that the intention to keep it at under six? Um, that that's our best guess estimate. Looking at other communities and the similar size station that we think we will need, and in working with the contractor, we think that uh, six million is the number. Until we have it designed and all the features and everything selected, we'll know better then, and it's bid out. They already negated my dance hall on the road. So. And, and we'll be very conservative with this. I know in the other one we pulled all the bells and whistles. We to pose the, uh, all this stuff. That to what? Two of those Pull. goals that I don't know if we use both of them, but I, I, I knew we really we have an awesome firehouse. But I just want to make sure that. Well, have you slowed down the fire? <laughs> no, I don't intend to. <laughs> but uh, no, that's what I'm speaking to that we would look at. This is a single story, I believe, correct? Right? It should be. We're going to attempt to design the building for all of our needs right now and to make it last for a 40 or 50 year building. So we need to hopefully design it to be able to meet the challenges of the village for 40 years. That's, okay. That's what we're going to do. It's okay. Not needing to be extravagant one bit. I, we're just going to try to meet all of our needs the best that we can. We need to design it and then come up with an accurate portrayal of what Okay. Because the other one just reminds me of the Alamo. It's, it's. I, I can't believe that during COVID people were still there. So, all right, thank you. Good question. All right. Moving um, on. Moving on. Uh, the next item, also on page 20, are the general drainage spot repairs. Uh, this is around the village. We will have, when regularly and always, have stormwater related projects that. Uh, affect people's lives are too big for us to fix in-house, but aren't necessarily large enough projects um, for their own individual line item in the budget. So for example, when you drive down streets in the winter and you see an area that always collects ice, that is a great example of something that is, that's a drainage issue. We can come in and repair that. We can repair, a, it's the intent of it, backyards. Sometimes we'll have issues where neighborhoods are experiencing large stormwater issues and we can put things in place to alleviate those often with neighborhood help and we've been very successful with this program uh it's only a few years old now and it's it's this one changes people's lives so it's a good program and the uh corner of laurel and magnolia is uh always flooding with with the train and I think we've gone a long way on Laurel further east uh, to resolve that issue. And I know we haven't finished it yet, but certainly some of the initial findings uh, were superb. And uh, they don't call me about drainage, they now call me about folks driving the wrong way on Laurel Avenue. <laughs> so uh, that, uh, yes, that corner down up further west at uh, Magnolia and Laurel, we, we've got to look at. And uh, I know you are. So. Yeah. But this is a great example of an incremental program. This is where we, we take small achievable bites and we will do several projects each year working with the neighborhood to make sure that we can take the value and spread it as far as we possibly can. That's the intent with this program. Sorry, just to clarify. So with this program, is it that our village is proactively 
um, finding different sites that need repair or is it our residents <coughs> coming to us and saying, I'm having this issue, can you assist me in? It's all of the above. Oh, okay, so it's both. It's, um, it's we're seeing them at different points because we're out in the community right. and we see these as they happen and we're out in storms and we've identified an area. All right, we're holding a lot of water for an inappropriate amount of time because there's an appropriate amount of time to hold water. If it's holding water for an hour and then the water goes away, that's probably, it's not great, especially if you're worried about it, but an hour might not be too bad. But if it's holding water for 48 hours or it's holding water for a week after a storm event, then, then that's something that's a challenge. Lots of times we can see it, in which case we can identify it and prioritize it. Lots of times we can't see it. We have lots of neighborhoods that, um, were developed maybe in the 60s and 70s prior to the current stormwater ordinances. And what happens is somebody wants a pool. They get a pool and maybe it wasn't a problem. And the individual pool isn't a problem, but maybe six or eight pools might be a challenge. Or you have a new fence put in and the fence doesn't allow drainage underneath or it moves drainage around your yard when it shouldn't. Uh, it could be landscaping. It can be, we have these things that develop over time and then we try to alleviate those without necessarily being onerous on the neighborhood and saying, okay, we're going to, you know, demand that everybody remove their pool, which we okay. wouldn't do. But um, so we, we handle all kinds of different issues. Okay. So I would encourage if anyone has a stormwater issue, contact us. And we, we even provide, there are lots of places where it's a private property issue. This is, this is a drainage issue and it's a private property issue. It's the homeowner's issue. But we even still provide technical assistance on that where we'll come in and try to help them figure out some way to alleviate some problem that they're having. That's a service that we provide. Okay. And, and just a follow-up question. So you said that this program is only a couple of years old. So um, are, are we proactive in our efforts and in, in letting our residents know that exists or has it primarily been used um, as a, like a, an, an emergency service? Like I'm having this issue this needs to be fixed. Well, maybe I can staff. speak to, to a little history here. We have uh, had a number of streets that were paved over, paved over, paved over, and they didn't retain the water the way they should have. And a lot of people with the, uh, back in the 60s and early 70s, they were building uh, ranch homes with the, I call them the go down type driveways. And so we had to implement a program that uh, helped raise the sidewalk so that uh, when we had a heavy rain when the water used to be retained, like for, you know, two hours uh, in the street, it was now going over the curb and then down into uh, those go down driveways into the lower level of the home. Okay. And so we had a program, and I, I think we still have it, but we had a lot of calls for that program where we had some uh, subsistence for the uh, homeowner. And pretty much that's dried up. I don't think we've had a call for that in a couple of years. Have we? The downward driveways? Yeah, for the, uh, you know. No, I, that, yeah, that program, we haven't had anything on that in, in quite a while. Yeah, we, I, I don't even know that we budget for it anymore. But the, we've had programs in place to help we alleviate do. that. And now when we do our street replacement, we've got to grind them down. Because some of our streets, you know, some of the older streets, you like cross them at the sidewalk. You're like going uphill and downhill. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've got to take some of these down so we can get that retention back. And that's a work in progress. And as we replace streets, we're serious about grinding off what we, you know, what was there for too long. And so it kind of slows that down, our re street replacement program. But we're pretty active on looking at street replacement and doing it right. And so we're getting back to, uh, you know, we've had those programs in the past. And so to keep some money in the till, I think, is smart when these things do pop up, whether it's whatever I define or some new type of uh, stormwater initiative. But it's, and maybe my, it's, it's my understanding when this was requested last year or the year before was that we had a list of known areas where people were complaining. So oh, okay. we focused on those and I don't know if we've made it through that list in the last couple of years, we're still working on them. And as we get through that list, as well as those that are brought to our attention, um, we can then move forward to to let more proactively let uh, residents know that it's available. So we kind of have like a backlog of repairs and right Yeah, now. the answer is both. 
Okay. It's, it's, we are in frequent contact with the residents that have stormwater issues and we identify them. Oh, okay. Okay. Because very often they're related. Okay. So we try to do both at the same time. Thank you. All right, we have uh, entryway signs. This is the uh, installation of three new entryway signs next year. We will do three this year. Uh, These are the gateway signs to the community that we're switching out those wood ones that are at, the gate, at all the entryways. All right. So we plan to do three a year? Well, three this year, three next year, plus the one at Gary and Lake. Uh, and plus the one at Gary and Lake, and we've identified additional places that we did not have entryway signage, and we will be uh, investigating those as we move forward. There will be additional signs in the future. There's other issues with those, like right-of-way acquisition and, and some utility issues and things like that. There will be additional requests for additional entryway signs in the future, even after we've replaced the ones that we currently have. TJ. Um I have a question. I know that we have two electronic signs on Barrington Road within yes, about 300 yards of each other. Is there any plan on putting an electronic sign on Lake Street with the high traffic volume and the visibility to announce events and different things that are going on in the village uh, with putting a, an electronic sign, let's say even in front of Village Hall, uh, putting an electronic sign there where it would be, I think, very utilized and, and, and be very visible? Is there any, any, is, is this the place or is the strategic plan the place to talk about that? But I think that we need to have that discussion about an electronic sign on, on Lake Street. I've seen other villages and in front of their village hall, they have electronic signs that announce all of the upcoming events and things that are going on. And with the amount of traffic, certainly a lot of Hannibal Park people also, you know, travel that route. I'm just wondering, is there any, has any thought been given to put an electronic sign on Lake Street. At maybe, if that's not the most desirable location, maybe even a more desirable location once we've done a study on it. Uh, as of right now, no. Uh, that is something we could bring up during strategic planning. Um, I would say my first blush on it is it's a little bit challenging where you place electronic signs because you really want to keep them away from intersections uh, because you don't want to distract drivers. Um, you want them to see it and you want to get the information, but we, we try to generally, the, 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 the rule is to keep them as certain distances from intersections as best you can. And the, one of the challenges with Lake Street is both high speed and lots of intersections. So that is certainly something we can explore. We have not explored it to date. We've generally tried to keep them on thoroughfares that had like long stretches with hopefully relatively few turns. Uh, but I know the one on the north one on Barrington does have some intersections not too far away from it, or at least some turn-ins. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I'm fine with those placements. I'm just yeah. wondering if we've considered uh, some additional placements of, of that type of signage. And the, so, the right-of-way on Lake Street is incredibly narrow. Yeah. To add to that, um, so I do think it's not in this budget. I do think we are going to have to talk about and budget if we want we're, I think that the sign uh, by um, Tap House Grill, it will need to be replaced and uh, it looks out of date and at some point we should talk about whether we want to replace that one with a new one along with the same design that's either at the sports complex or the, our entryway signs or if we decide that it's too close to the one and redundant with the sports complex one, maybe finding a new location. Yeah. I've also met with the park district director who has said that they would like to work with the village to put one um, near um, on the property by Safari Springs, which is a east-west route, um, I believe that. Greenbrook, yeah. Greenbrook. Mm -hmm. um, so they would like to, to work with us that our information in there, the community's information could go on that one too. So Let's have that's that not Lake Street, but... Yeah, let's have that discussion. So Great. I, um, Strategic plan discussion. Okay. Uh, the next item also on page 21 is arterial fence maintenance. That is not the installation of new arterial fence. That is the maintenance of existing arterial fence. A lot of the fencing is 20, in some cases plus years old. And we're starting to run into large areas that need some heavy replacements. So you'll see this a reoccurring theme over time 
as trying to just make sure that that fence isn't breaking and is working both for the residents and for the, uh, the roads that it's on. One of the key components with that is is to um, keep the weeds from growing through, and uh, we've got to address that with the homeowners that have the benefit of that fence. But when the weeds grow through, they start breaking that fence. And yeah, it was a many year program incrementally replacing that fence, but what a huge difference it made in our community from what we had, all these hodgepodge fences all over the place. And I do know that the uh, folks along, um, is it Chick Road, where the firehouse is going, uh, they have that like horse fence along there, you know, I call them horse fence, you know, the three sticks. <laughs> and they're, they're talking about an arterial fence. And they're the ones that, when the program started, um, they didn't want that kind of fence. So they were off the list. But now they're talking about they want that type of uh, fence along their properties also. And I'm talking to them about considering an SSA to help with uh, share the cost among those homeowners. That's all I have on that. You can move on. All right. The next item is on page 24. Uh, it's called the West Bank Steam Bank Stabilization and Fox to the Village Limits. This is a project that we currently have a grant for and will continue to seek additional monies for. And this is a project in coordination with the Village of Schaumburg where we will take the, um, the stream bank from the Ann Fox grade at Ann Fox School north into Schaumburg, stabilize it, reduce the amount of uh, debris that we get moving south during high storm events, reconfigure the Ann Fox grate. Uh, and some of you uh, hopefully recall, uh, we're working with the park district right now on- you, what, uh, I'm sorry, what, what page what are you on? I thought it was 24, am I wrong? Bottom yes. 24. It's, it's the bottom of page 24. Okay. 700,000. Okay, thank you. Um, we're working with the park district right now. They're ultimately, that'll be reconfigured. Right now we have a neighborhood uh, where we keep a piece of equipment uh, 24 seven, 365, and we will frequently have to have that equipment scrape debris off of a grate uh, in the middle of storm events to keep that neighborhood from flooding. Uh, so it's, we think that can be done better. It's now reaching the end of its life. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, <clears throat> beyond the end of its life where that grade's gonna fall in here before long. And uh, it needs to be reconfigured so that it'll just serve the community better. PJ, this is our, this is that property that we worked with the park district for? Yes, ma'am. This is it? Yes. And we have a $400,000 grant, right? John, how much is that grant, do you recall? That's what rent is. That's what I remember, but I, I just wanna make sure that I'm right. Is that an MWRD grant? No, but it's EPA, but we are applying for, we haven't gotten the MWRD grant a couple of times, but we continue to work with them, hoping that we'll, we will get that one. We are looking for additional funding for this, and we think we're well-placed to do it. GIGO is an acronym for what? Green, I know it's green infrastructure, something, something. I, I said normally I'm great with the acronyms. Says that that's where the grant is being funded through GIGO and IEPA. Right, but it, it's it's through the IEPA, but it's a specific grant within the IEPA. Okay. So it's not that's the name of the grant, not the agency. Yeah, IPA is the agency. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we have a grant for four hundred thousand, so we are on the hook for three hundred thousand for the um, excuse me remaining three hundred thousand, or is that a shared cost between us and the village of Schaumburg? Oh, uh, that's, I'm with John. You know. Right, come on up. 700,000 is our cost. Uh, it's our cost, up. Yeah. Okay. So then Schaumburg pays a little bit more than that because they are getting a little bit more benefit and there's more work being done in Schaumburg. Okay. okay. So in the budget, we have a revenue line of 400,000, which covers the grant we've received to date. Uh, they will, we will, continue to try to get grant funding to for the remaining 300 uh, and then if we're successful that would then offset that even further okay thank you <clears throat> all right the next item is on page number 21 it is parkway trees the replacement of parkway trees for 
I mean, we regularly have trees that die or have to come down for disease reasons or different things like that, or sometimes damaged in accidents. And this will be approximately 80 new trees next year. When I drive down Hawthorne, or down <laughs> Walnut, I see trees that probably should have been covered under warranty. And two days ago, somebody drove their car through one, so that's sitting there broken. But the trees are always a challenge as we get new ones. And we have, I, I think, we've got to pay a little closer attention to some of those trees. And now that, you know, we've got to trim them. You know, when I see sprouts growing from the ground up on those, right. we've, got to, we've got to pay attention to that. We do. We take care of that in the winter. Uh, killing the, the suckers is what we call them. Uh, cutting the suckers in the summer uh, is hard on the trees. Um, it's, so what you're seeing is it's, it's actually sort of a sign that the tree might be in stress already. Otherwise, it wouldn't have the suckers like that. So there's something already going on with the trees. So we wait until the trees are dormant in the winter, and we'll come through and take the suckers out. Uh, it's just there's something already going on with the tree when you see that. So we try to be cognizant of that, try to diagnose it if we can, and if we can't, then we just take the suckers out in the winter. But some of them are dead in the winter. You can't tell whether they're dead or alive. Absolutely. And, and for dead trees, we identify them during the, during the summer. But for suckers, we can see them all the time. Uh, next is Village Hall rooftop units. Um, that's actually the air conditioners that we have up, sitting on the roof above us right now in, a, in the building. Uh, most of them are original to the building. They are long, long, far beyond their life expectancy. We've done a lot of work on them over time, uh, but it's, we're, we're reaching the end of our ability to do that. These are the uh, air conditioning units? Yes. So with the, um, the new normal of, of COVID and, and uh, the, <clears throat> the requirement for the advanced or upgraded filtration systems, will this replacement take into account that uh, we, since we're going to be replacing those, Will they have the ability to have some of the new recommendate, recommended higher filtration ca yes. capacities uh, as opposed to some of the old systems when it wasn't necessary? Right. But now with you know, COVID being such a, you know, a critical part of our, our, our everyday lives, will these new systems incorporate that type of uh, uh, filtration? Yes. These will have the most modern filtration systems on them. Okay. Now, all right, that being said, we're, we're, not we're going to make sure that we're getting the filtration systems that really do work. Um, there are lots of different systems out there uh, with lots of different levels of eff efficacy. And we're going to get the ones that are most efficient and most effective for what we're trying to do. So for example, one of the best things you can do is just maximize your air movement. Just get new air in, get old air out, get new air in. Um, that's less a function of filtration than it is just simply air returns. Movement, yeah. yeah. Okay. But so, for example, we have absolutely maxed out our existing systems uh, in order to do that since COVID, way beyond what you'd ordinarily ask for and say you want this many air turnovers in a room of a certain size at any given time. You sit down and you balance the system based on how many you know air turnovers you want. And so we've maxed out, basically, we can't, the machines just aren't, the ones we have now, mm -hmm. are not capable of turning over many more air than we do currently. Mm -hmm. So, and that was a result of COVID, so for example. Okay. Uh, next items are the boilers on page 22. Uh, the boilers in the public works facility, they are original to the building. Um, they are failing. Uh, the next is bulletproof glass replacement at the police station, that is on page 23. Uh, we did a partial replacement, I believe it was this year, right, Mike? We did that this year, right? The years are blending together. Um, and we're going to do the second half of that project next year. That's the bulletproof glass in the lobby. Um, as you walk right in and look forward at records, that would be there. And then also, actually, if you look over to your right in the um, code enforcement area. Do we know what's causing them to crack? It, it appears to be just age. Um, like a lot of things, it's just, it, over time, it just breaks down. There's just a chemical reaction with the air. 
So it's, it's not a product that will have an indefinite life expectancy, say like, you know, a piece of glass. And it's, it's not so much, well, there is cracking, but it's also the, there's a film on there that's really what's cracking. So there's, there's multiple layers to it. Um, all right, we're gonna have a couple of items here. Uh, we've already kind of touched on it, so I'll just touch on the next three, which are on page 22 and 23. Uh, we're doing a refresh at Fire Station 15, that's the headquarters station. Um, you've already talked about the AV system in the basement. Uh, next year we're proposing painting, carpeting, and a kip kitchen refurbishment. Uh, they really are 24-hour facilities, and this is something that's, that's been overdue. Next item on page 24 is an alignment machine for our fleet. Uh, we have an existing machine, again, far, far beyond its life expectancy. Uh, the new machines are computer controlled and can work much faster and, and work just in a lot of ways better than the existing machine can. We can't really get the existing machine fixed anymore. All right, the next item is on page 13. So there's several items in here, and John, you may want to come up here and join me for this. Um, so we're talking about resurfacing for next year, and there, there are multiple components to this, but really they're all kind of, I'll say kind of lumped together. We're doing sort of the same thing. So we have a state grant. We have several grants that we'll talk about. Uh, one is the rebuild grant. So this is not MFT, motor fuel tax, but we are using it for resurfacing. So that is 834,000. The next item, which is on page 12, is 1.5 million. Now that is being used for, also for resurfacing. There is $2 million, ultimate, the village received $4 million um, in ARP, that's the name for that, right? American Rescue Plan? Yeah. Um, or do, am I getting my grants wrong on that? All right, which one is that? So maybe we should just talk about the road program as a whole, and then okay. we can t say how we're funding it rather than talking through the different funding sources, mm -hmm. maybe. So as part of our road program, we have MFT funding, which is your motor, motor fuel tax. We get about $1.5 million for that. There's also the state grant it's the rebuild grant the state's giving out for three years we get eight hundred and thirty four thousand dollars each year um, we started receiving it last last year um, and used it this year as part of our program for the first time um, those are our two main sources well the mft is our regular money that we get every year that is our main source we now have the extra rebuild money um, and using those two, this year we had a program of about a little over seven miles of paving. So we're hoping to recreate that with that money. We also have in here a street reconstruction of six, $600,000, which we've got a few streets that are failed beyond being able to just take off two inches of asphalt and put two inches of asphalt back. Um, so these actually have to go down to the base, replace all of the stone in the base and rebuild the street. There's also in here a $2 million um, legislative infrastructure money, which as part of the capital bill in 2019, I believe, or 2020, um, we were awarded $4 million. Yep. So $2 million of that is going to be coming for resurfacing, and $2 million will go into water main replacement. So this is still this is the last one on 13 right is that what you're doing or so that exactly? was 12 was the mft uh the rebuild grant was on 13 reconstruction mm -hmm. was on 13 and then uh infrastructure was on 15. Uh, on 15. Can, thank you so can you add that all up and, and explain to the board the total project uh, while, while you're doing that can i ask where in the budget <clears throat> where in the budget would we find funds for a construction project that would involve uh, putting sidewalks on the east side of center avenue uh, from uh, 
Lake Street up to Laurel Avenue, there are no sidewalks on the east side of the street. And residents come to me constantly uh, because their children, they're not able to ride their bicycles up and down the street. They have to cross to the other side of the street and all of the problems that that causes. And I told them that I would try to address this during our upcoming sessions. So is there any place in this budget to consider or to, to look at putting sidewalks on the east side of Center Avenue uh, for that stretch? Well, we'd have to look at right of way issues first. We'd have to see if we could, otherwise we'd have to acquire. Would it be okay if we got back to you on that? Absolutely, um, yeah. uh, let A, we need to look into it and see what, what the place would be. We need, we need to do uh, like sort of a cocktail napkin amount of how much it would cost. We would need to look at <coughs> right of way issues to see if acquisition would be an issue. I'm going to assume that it isn't, but it could be. Um, cause for whatever reason, I feel like on the east side there that the road actually sits a little bit to the east there in the right of way. Cause on one side, the, the front yards seem a little bigger than on the others than on the east side, they the east are. side, yeah. the front yards seem kind of shallow, which just in my head makes me wonder if that's, if for whatever reason it was moved off the roadway was moved off to one side. So we would need to look at that. And look into it and get back to me. I don't want to belabor it now, yeah. but. I just want to put it on the radar and, okay. and see if there's any place that we can address it. Well, so I, I, I appreciate you investigating it. Yeah, the other thing is, is that we have a list of these types of projects that then are very helpful to have when uh, a grant comes forward and we're able to, um, a lot of these projects have been out there and we've been able to tie them to grant funding that's become available. So. Um, I know we di are doing another sidewalk project through an ITEP grant, right, uh, yeah. in the next couple of years. So. Thank you. So, so certainly, can, uh, so strategically, you, we, we can get that, have that conversation. Can you add get up the done. street program? Uh, 4.3 million. Okay, 4 so, 3 4, million. so we're doing a $4.3 million street program this year, this next year. Uh, the village board, uh, named the, pri the top priority to be infrastructure replacement and improvement. So we'd focus this next budget on through the coupling of grants and other funding sources uh, for street reconstruction replacement, as well as you'll see the water main uh, um, replacement uh, in the water and sewer fund. So that's the majority of the, the capital funds that we have are going for those two, two areas. And, and would this project that we're putting together ensure that all of our streets and curbs uh, are IDA ex, uh, compliant? ADA. 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 Yes. Sorry. Whenever so, we, ADA. Yeah. whenever we go through an area, we're required by law um, to when we're using this type of funding or when we're touching an intersection and touching the sidewalk ramps, we have to make sure that they are compliant with ADA requirements. And how often do we inspect uh, our sidewalks? Uh, and, and uh, different uh, places throughout the village to ensure that they are sometimes through wear and tear, they get out of compliance. So how often do we go through the village to find, to ensure that there are ADA or con con continue to be ADA compliant? Well, there's two components of that. So let me jump into that. So we have inspected the town for ADA compliance. We have an ADA transition plan that we use currently. Uh, we also have a sidewalk inspection program now that's separate from a specific look towards ADA. That is mostly looking for trip hazards or deviations where the sidewalk could in theory be dangerous um, or be a, a liability to the village should somebody fall. So we do that <clears throat> annually. We go through, we look, we prioritize, and then we come through. In fact, a large part of our sidewalk program in general. So for example, even some of you may have heard me say this in the past where somebody sends a picture and says this sidewalk is is horribly ugly and I want it replaced. Very often I will have be put in the position to say it is you're right it is ugly and you're right in a perfect world I would replace it but it is not a trip hazard. And our our focus is almost entirely on the removal of trip hazards or dangerous sidewalk. So in fact I've even had people say you replace two squares, you left two squares, you replace two squares. Well, that's because those four squares were dangerous and those two squares were not. And, you know, you left two old squares of sidewalk. Yes, I did. Um, so we, we do regularly go through. 
and looking at it from the safety perspective. Okay, because there may be instances where there is um, overlap between a trip hazard and ADA accessibility. You bet, you bet. absolutely there is. Yeah, okay. I, since we're hot to trot on ADA, uh, the um, last conversation I had concerning ADA uh, with the state and with um, the federal government passing some regulations 20 some years ago that uh, Northwest Municipal Conference just had a, uh, a dialogue with transportation around uh, the 80, the, there must be 13 communities, 15 communities maybe of the 285 in Northeast Illinois. Hanover Park happens to have a plan, but the plan covers about 15% of the requirement. So uh, I do have some information I wanted to share, but not tonight. But just to give you a heads up on the uh, ADA component, that's uh, they're they're looking stronger at our at our uh, reporting and our transition plan. Uh, if if we can work on that, they're looking stronger at that than they are uh, what we're actually doing, because nobody's up to speed within the state on ADA compliance, with the exception of. Metro Railroad, and because uh, when we have an accident, we got to fix it. So uh, that's a whole different thing. We've got a whole program there. But the uh, municipalities have been way behind, and so we're trying to address that. So look for that. I also want to say that we talked about Walnut Street and the repairs uh, of Walnut. Hopefully, that's going down to the base because that is a disaster. And they keep the last time we restored that, the same problem came back. Like every 20 feet, you got to you know, uh, cross the road, you know, clunk, you know. I notice it more in one car than I do in my pickup, but the uh, uh, the neighbors are all saying, this, this street's ridiculous. Is that a plan to take that down to the base, first of all, on Walnut? We're not going all the way down to the stone. Um, that would be basically a reconstruction of the street. So we are going to try to address it um, just by once we get the surface off, uh, take a closer look at what's out there and either do some patching or do some additional work or do some more exploration and to see what's causing those cracks. Okay, because, you know, that, that's a reoccurring problem and it's, uh, you know, it drives me crazy as it does the whole neighborhood. And I noticed that some of the, the sidewalk areas that go into Walnut, there is no other side. And so the neighbors want keep that, retain that, did we decide we could do that? Uh, no, we cannot do that. Because then you have children getting on the buses, you got people walking their dogs to go across the street, and they have to go sideways, and they wa end up walking through the middle of the intersection. To me, that makes no sense. So we need to talk more about that. Okay. Let's yeah. move on. Uh, under ADA, that's... Well, that I'm just saying, we don't want to add to the jeopardy of people in the neighborhood that walk across <clears> to, the, to the grassy area. Okay. Um, Sorry, before we move on, just really quickly. So I guess the mayor just answered my question. So are we as board members allowed to, I guess, provide suggestions on streets that we think just need a little bit more attention? Because if we are spending, you know, a little over $4 million on this whole project and um, if a really, really bad street um, doesn't get fixed, it would, um, I guess be a bit frustrating for our residents. So I, I guess I'm just trying to make sure well, that. Uh, we try to handle the worst streets first. Okay. And we also, it, it's more complicated than saying the worst first. We try to handle the worst first, but in, for example, in some instances, the worst street also has water main underneath it that needs to be replaced. Mm. So we have to then prioritize, can we do the, do we have funding to do the water main because if we replace the street and make the street look great, and then I've got six water main breaks in the next year, I've now cut up a brand new street six times. So for example, this year, um, this current year that we're in, we passed over a couple of streets knowing that we were applying for grants or that we would have additional, we hoped and we think mm -hmm. is actually gonna turn out this way, that we'll have additional water fund money, like we're applying $2 million to the water fund uh, to replace water main underneath streets that we're then going to go in and replace. So, so in for conjunction. example, we're working very hard to do Northway next year 
uh, from north to south. Uh, it really needs it. The challenge is, is that it needs water main underneath it. So it's going to be a project that includes both the surface and the subsurface. So basically, we're, we are aware of them. And there are times when some streets will say, we're going to wait and get a group of these together um, to minimize logistics costs mm -hmm. and mobilization costs. So it could be that a cul-de-sac waits a little while, waits a year or two, till the larger circle is being done, and then the cul-de-sac is picked up as mm, part of that. That's helpful. That's that's good to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. No, that, that makes sense. And I, I guess I was just asking because I had can, uh, uh, Catalina Drive in my mind. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it needs some it attention. Need and um, yeah. I would hate for us to just like go through this big project and, you know, right. constituents are coming to us. And then and we applied for so, a grant yeah. for Catalina this year. We're well aware of it. It is something that we're going to be, I mean, it's high on the list of priorities. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. The, uh... Thank you. <laughs> I, I would encourage, if you have a suggestion, to certainly bring that forward. And uh, you'll find that it's on our list or it's somewhere on the, when, when things start to fail, uh, they fail to a point, and then they really start to fail. And so um, I know you mentioned Catalina, but there are, we've been talking about Catalina for a while, and uh, I, I, I think it is on our list, is it not? Absolutely. Yeah, he's I don't know that it'll be done priority. next year. But it, it's it's a street that will be done relatively soon. Okay. So thank you. I, I encourage you know you see things you know take a photograph and you know share it. Uh, those are the kind of things that we see in our community. Rick Roberts used to whine about the long weeds on the corners you know at the red light things and mm -hmm. and different things like that. So everybody has their uh, their uh, what something you need to speak to right. and uh, certainly you know bring it to uh, staff's attention. And uh, in include the manager when you do that because TJ will forget and then the manager won't or vice versa. Just real quick. When did that, when did that surveying of the streets? Yeah, we looked at uh, We've done a couple of them now since I've been here. Plus, we actually go out and do it ourselves mm. uh, mm -hmm. annually. The last comprehensive one was last fall. Okay. When did we get the results on that? Okay. Last Before fall. So we did it last summer, and then we got the results of it last fall. Yeah. Okay. And Trustee Bankhall, it, what I've, because I'm like advocating for Northway, um, because it's, it's in there, and it's off of Ann Fox, and these poor kids riding their bikes, they, they jump so high into potholes. Um, so. But I've, I've, I've done that. I, I met with TJ. We talked. We had, we, he came out. We talked with a group of people, too, in my, in my neighborhood because of water issues. So. Absolutely advocate for them. Yeah. yeah, I just wasn't sure like what exactly the process was, but yeah, he, yeah. he walked through it. So yeah, thank you. Thank so, you. you also talk about the, uh, okay, uh, yeah, I'm going to let John do this one. Uh, so that's in the operating budget. So it's not in here, but we are expanding the treatment, um, the preventive maintenance of our streets. So rather than just resurfacing streets, there's 20 different techniques out there to help extend the life. So yeah. in the past, That's we've kind of been limited in what we've done, but uh, we want to, as we're paving more and more streets, continue to maintain them so that they don't age prematurely. So, so that's something new we're implementing. Yeah, we used to do a little bit of it, but we're trying to expand it and, you know, like if you were at IML, they might have referred to it as pavement rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. So where in the past it was kind of, you know, crack filling and that was it. There are a lot of modern techniques and we're starting to incorporate those mm -hmm. in a life cycle of the road. Roads have, a, roads have a life expectancy. We have now learned over the course of lots of research in the last, particularly the last decade, that we can take that life expectancy and make it longer. Now, when you come in, you think, you say, I want to put money into roads. 
And so I want new asphalt. And new asphalt is great. I want new asphalt too. But it's also these rejuvenation techniques. And you're saying, why are you spending money on a road that's only five years old? Well, because that'll take that from being a 15-year road to maybe being a 25-year road. Mm -hmm. So put, investing into year five is a huge benefit in year 25, as opposed to coming and saying, I want that in a new road and I want you to do one block of asphalt or we could do rejuvenation techniques and make an entire neighborhood live that much longer. Mm. Makes sense. Thank so you. Si since a Northway hit the deck here about three or four times, we had, uh, Cook County had a uh, beautification or a, uh, enhanced, I forget the name of the program. And uh, I worked with uh, Cook County, uh, the guy in charge of transportation, John Yonan. He'd since got a promotion, so he has a new person there. But they, we applied, and we followed the rules, and we used Northway. And what was the total? Was that 600000 It was about 600000 So Northway was a major component through our community. We submitted that. Uh, I kept bugging Kevin Morrison uh, on that, you know, make sure, you know, we got the letter of support. We get, it went the whole nine yards. And then when it came out and we were rejected, I was a little sideways over the fact that we didn't get those dollars. They went to projects that instead of being shovel ready, which was the intent, they went to studies for different things. Um, there was a study along 95th Street in the city of Chicago, $5 million. And I said, are you kidding me? The city of Chicago is getting their own transportation dollars for improvements at a great sum, a huge sum, billion dollars or more. And I said, those of us out here, we need $600,000 for a serious road replacement and sidewalks, if I recall, mm -hmm. uh, curbs and sidewalks. And so um, when we were rejected on that, and I had this conversation with them, I said, don't take this personal, but I'm feeling a little offended that we weren't considered. You know, we're not an affluent community out here. And when I, when I use staff's time, and we don't have a lot of staff time, we're not a staff-rich community. And so when we invest that kind of time, and then it gets fluffed off, sloughed off, or whatever word you want to call it, I get a little uh, uptight about that. And so he went to Tony Preckwinkle, and he said, I think we got to find some money for Hanover Park to, to get this done. Now, I don't know how they're going to do it, or when they're going to do it, or how they're going to do it, but certainly uh, these are the kind of things that we have to step up to, and uh, you know, I don't want to say it's political, but I want to say that they have to be sensitive to the needs of communities like Hanover Park. We can't take the hits like a Schomburg could took over $18 million, take those kind of hits. That would wipe us out, okay? But they're moving on and they're, they're getting uh, interest and, and projects. We're a little different, and we're, but we're on the edge of that. We're not a community with, that has a, um, a Woodfield Mall to help us with all those resources. So we're working on that, and uh, Northway is just a key component for me. And if you ever, if any of the board members have a conversation with me, Northway is, uh, in particular, uh, one of those. And we're going to have opportunities, those that are, you that are going to IML, to take that story, and when you have a chance, just use it. Use that story where we do some time and we invest, and we ask staff to, to take the extra time to put that project together so it's shovel ready. We can't accept the fact that we were rejected on that. That's just not acceptable for me. And of course, that means I care about Hanover Park. And as we all do, you wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't. And so those are the kind of things that when we all get together and you never know who you're going to sit down with when you go to IML, uh, you might be, be in a, in a, a Coke line and uh, you know, be talking to somebody that has some influence. It might be somebody from the head of that transportation. It might be Kevin Morrison. I don't know. But you have that story, and I thought I'd take the time to share it because we are going to be down there where they're all coming together, and they want to impress upon the elected officials of our residential communities from across the state. And so we, if we have that opportunity, I think we have to be sensitive to it. And the $4 million that came from the state, I forget what the fund was, the Build Illinois Fund, mm. that was a promise that made, that was kept by Christina Castro. And did I bug her for the last two years? You know I did. And it finally came. And the, the President of the Senate was very 
he, he knew it too. And so they were pleased to finally pull that together for us. Our streets are important to our residents. And so that makes it important to us. So I just wanted to trip on that dance a little bit. That is seven miles. Mm -hmm. A little bit. So a little over seven miles. Well, that's seven point something miles of roadway that we're able to do this year and next year actually equates to about 7% of the roads in town. Um, and remember, you then have 93% that are getting older every year. So it's something that we have, for an extended period of time, had less than $2 million for many, many years, decades even. We were doing less than $2 million a year, and every year your dollar gets incrementally smaller, or if you prefer to look at it, the cost of putting a new roadway in gets incrementally bigger. So it's a long-term issue, and it's something we'll talk about strategically. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the Irving Park Road Lighting and Safety Project. This is a DCEO-funded project. We believe it will occur next year. That is 300000 Sorry, what page? Oh, I'm sorry, that is page 13. Uh, on page 14, we have $35,000 for new street lights. Every year we work uh, with the police department on finding where we have dark spots. And that could be, generally speaking, as many as eight or as few as three street lights, depending on the individual conditions um, of the lights that are prioritized at that time. Uh, this year it was eight. Uh, so we kind of lucked out. Speaking of lights, you know, um, we should try to replace a couple every year of the lighted signs, street signs. I think it, it contributes to the look, but it helps you find streets. You know, like we have Walnut lighted, uh, our new downtown area, Ontarioville Road, we should have that lighted. Uh, there's, there's uh, if, incrementally, if we do a few each year, I think it'll get us on the pathway to where we should, I feel we should be. Um, next item is the Arlington Drive bridge reconstruction at 480,000. That is our portion, the village's share. Uh, that is on page 14. Uh, we believe that will occur this year or next year. Uh, Lake Street pedestrian access, that is 20,000. That project is actually complete, uh, but we believe that we'll be billed for it next year. Uh, that's the uh, Walnut and Lake right east of us here across from Fresh Express, there was new sidewalk in front of Village Hall, there was a new crossing at Fresh Express. TJ, can you back up to the, to the bike path construction? Reconstruction? Oh, did I skip one? Yeah. Where? If you could just say oh. the page number two at where you at. Yeah, I'm, yeah, oh, okay. it's gonna come All up right. later. Okay. Yeah, I'm working off a, a different list. All right. <laughs> what list? You're not gonna miss the bike path, I'll tell you that. Uh, the next item actually is also on 14, which is bike path construction and reconstruction. Uh, there you go, on page 14. Uh, that is the repair of existing bike paths and possibly a filling of small gaps. Um, 
we have bike paths in town that are just becoming difficult to transverse and will be the intent is to resurface those. I was just on a, uh, the first uh, call for this season with the uh, Northwest Municipal Conference, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Conference uh, with Kendra Johnson. Um, and we're talking about that. And there's a, a GIS system that they have that shows the connectivity between the bike paths for all of the existing communities. And I, I, was, I asked her to forward that to us because I don't know if we have that information. Hmm. But if we don't, I've asked her to forward that to us. That'd be great. And she also uh, was asking if uh, we wanted to name either you or Jonathan as alternates to that committee. Uh, I was sitting in on the, on the meeting, and there was a, a lot of uh, village engineers and, and uh, public works people, so I kind of felt a little bit out of my element in terms of technical expertise, uh, but I knew what I knew about the, our, the state of our bicycle paths. Uh, and so I said all that to say that uh, I, I want to make sure that we are allocating enough resources so that we can continue the development of our bicycle plan within Hannibal Park. Uh, first of all, I'd like for us to, within this $50,000, it says for repair and reconstruction of existing segments of the bike paths. And I'd like to have those existing segments identified and then as we identify where we need repair and reconstruction, we can also look at extension and expansion. Uh, and I wanna make sure that those items are also in the budget so that as we move forward, we can have a, a more comprehensive look at, at the bicycle plan and pedestrian plan for Hannibal Park. Okay. Uh, we can maybe talk about that also during the operating budget. Okay. Um, this was really intended to be for reconstruction of existing and, and, and filling up small now, gaps. I'd like to throw right. it out there. So yeah, let's have that discussion. Yeah. Do an operating budget, uh, yeah. and and well, we can do that. So if you make a note of it, I appreciate yeah. it. And strategically. And that would be fine to add John or I as delegate. And I don't know if, I don't know where we would actually. Let me contact you on who would be let's the best person for it. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, we we'd have to have some discussion on that. I put John on a bunch of committees. He's starting to get, starting to get a complex about it. Um, the next item is also grant funded. Uh, this is on page 15. This is the Ontarioville and Devon. Uh, this is our share. I may want to let John, I'm going to take a crack at this one, but if he jumps up, it's because I said something wrong. Um, we have a grant right now to resurface Ontarioville and Devon. It's going to be all of Ontario Villa Devon from Lake Street to the western corporate limits, less the area that we just resurfaced as part of our downtown project. It'll be everything else. Did I do that right? Oh, rock on. <laughs> um, that was good. I screwed that up earlier. You need a five minute break? We all do. Yeah. So move. I can get some water. Is yeah. your microphone on, Juliana? All right. Take five. I'll go get some water. Water, I just, water. I just pause, right? Okay. Pause. The pause. Um, that's a good story. Evergreen Tower Rehab. This is, uh, we call it rehab. This would be the painting of the Evergreen Water Tower. It's 410000 It's also on page 32. Is it peeling? I'm sorry? Did we just put that in? Uh, no, sir. No, it's been there a long time. Okay. And uh, it's both that the, um, the exterior, which will be uh, refinished, there will also be interior upgrades. There are also, almost with every tower rehab, there are required OSHA improvements that need to be made for working in and around the water tower. The next is well number six. This is on page 33.
Yes, indeed. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, next item on page 33 is the submersible well pump assembly for well number six. This is only if needed, but it may be. Uh, the next item is water distribution. We've already talked the two million for that. Uh, we have $3.8 million for uh, water main improvements next year. Those will go underneath roads that we're resurfacing. Uh, the next is the water system valve replacement. This is for the replacement of three valves, but very, very important. I'm sorry, this is on page 34. Um, these are very, very challenging valves to replace, and they are failing even as we speak. So they, they certainly need to be replaced. Uh, the next item is on page 34. As you're aware, we're replacing water meters in town. Uh, this is what we expect to continue to on that project for next year. Um, Senator Duckworth, just to be a quick comment, was pleased to hear we were investing in water. She's very engaged with water. It's a great project. Uh, the next item we're moving into wastewater treatment is the back backup generation at the Jefferson lift station. This is on page 35 for 54,000. Uh, we have emergency pump replacement. Uh, this is an ongoing. This happens every year uh, for 35, 000, or on page 35 for 50,000. We have spare pumps for the Kingsbury lift station on page 34 for 35,000. Moving to page 37, uh, we have a condition assessment for the lift stations in DuPage County. Uh, on page 35, we have the oxidation ditch bearing and gearbox repair. That's a repair to existing hardware at our current um, sewer treatment plant. Uh, next is the oxidation ditch optimization uh, to make the plant more efficient. Uh, we have uh, for 15,000 on page 36, the replacement of obsolete influent and effluent samplers. Uh, this is how we measure um, what the plant is doing. And this is the function of how we take our measurements to then report to the IEPA. Uh, the samplers are original to the plant and to be quite honest, poorly placed. So we're replacing those. Sorry, uh, really quickly, can you clarify what a lift station is? Well, I've been told no stories. I've, I've been admonished. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, Wait, what? So what happens is um, stuff really does roll downhill. That's both a euphemism and literally true. So our sewers are gravity fed. They're not actually pressurized unless it is a force main. So regular sewer lines are gravity fed, which means they have to have an incline to them. So the water that goes into a sewer pipe rolls downhill, mm -hmm. but it can't roll downhill forever. So what happens is eventually you reach a point and we'll say approximately every neighborhood, it's not quite like that, but let's, for the sake of argument, let's say in every neighborhood, you're gonna have a place where there's a reservoir and a pump, in fact, several pumps generally, where it will then move it back up. And it's, it's literally what it is, it's lifting the sewage from a low point to a high point mm -hmm. where it will begin its travels again via gravity so we don't have to have the constant use of electricity for pumps. Those pumps only run when the reservoir reaches a certain point. So you could in theory have a, a lift station that if everybody's on vacation and it's the summer and people aren't really doing much, it might only run a couple times an hour. If you're in a high flow event and it's you're getting lots of I and I, so you're getting lots of water into the sewer system, it could run almost constantly. So it, it's literally just lifting it from a lower elevation to a higher elevation. Okay, thank you. And I could show them, call me, we'll go look at one. They're actually kind of scary. Okay. <laughs> they really are. Um, <clears throat> sorry, lose my place here. Um, so the next is the UV system uh, design engineering. Uh, in the future, hopefully the following year, uh, we will be replacing our ultraviolet disinfection system. Uh, we're going to design it next year, hopefully for replacement or the request of the board to replace the following year. Uh, the next, we're moving into sanitary sewer collection. This is on page 39. 
uh, the Barrington Road sanitary sewer replacement. This is a stretch uh, actually in front of the electronic sign. Uh, the north one by Tony's is being replaced. Uh, the next one is, I mentioned I and I just a second ago. Uh, there's $100,000 on page 38 for our, annually we're required to do certain things for reporting to the MWRD. Um, this is both the report and the various tasks that we have to do within that basin to prepare the report. So dye flooding, for example, we will do things in the community to show how INI enters into the system and how we're, what we're doing to remove INI from the system. Uh, coincidentally, the next one is manhole sealing, which removes INI from the sewer system. Inflow and infiltration, I apologize, I should have said that. Uh, so it's basically anything that isn't sewage getting into a sanitary line. We don't want stormwater in a sanitary line. It doesn't belong there. Um, plum tree lift station force main engineering. Um, I know whenever I talk about force mains, they're the big force. We have one very, very large force main. We also have several smaller force mains in town um, that will eventually need repairs made to them. This is a design for the repair of a smaller force main. Uh, the next item on page 39, three, 375,000. This is the sanitary sewer force main repair. This is the repair on our large force main uh, that goes from the Bayside lift station up to the sanitary sewer treatment plant. There are basically four spots identified. They're really sort of three locations before projects identified. Um, and we're gonna need to make those repairs. We're actually going, if approved by the village board, we will make those repairs over the winter um, one of the rare times you'll ask me, I will actually go looking to dig in the winter time, but this project will actually be easier in the winter. Uh, the, didn't we have one of the four fail? We had to do emergency repair. Uh, we did have uh, a failure approximately a month ago, six weeks ago. I'd like to put it out of my mind. Uh, we did have a failure. There was an emergency response. We uh, did report back to the village board with the the results of that uh, so it was very dramatic at the time and we're looking to be able to keep that from ever happening like that again uh, the next item is sanitary sewer backup prevention on page 38 some of you may have rec uh, recall this was originally called the overhead sewer program um, this is a program that helps residents stop in uh, sewer backups into their home uh, it's actually, we modified the program this last year. It's been extremely successful. We've had, a, by the end of the year, we will probably have six people that have taken advantage of it, six homes that have taken advantage of it this year. It's, I mean, that doesn't sound like a lot. That's actually a wild success. So it's, it really is good. It's been going on for a number of years. How much is it per family or per built per home? Well, it's, it, I think there's a maximum of 5,000, uh, but with some modifications we've made to the program this past year, I believe it's 50% or 5,000. Did I get that right? Anywhere near close uh, to that? 75-25. Um, and we did, we made some modifications to the program uh, to include different technology and people have really been taking advantage of it. It's, it's been a big help. All right, the next item is sanitary sewer rehab. That's on page 37, that's 150,000. Uh, the next item, Juliana may want to take, it's on page 16. It's a public art mural. Uh-oh. So, okay. <clears throat> so a couple, uh, years ago, a few years ago, now, um, we started talking about And so we thought um, a lot of communities are now um, ha have taken on doing some um, 
some murals, some wall murals, and we thought that would be a good location with people coming out to that area to have a mural done on the side of that, uh, that building. So for, for, to fulfill the public art piece this year, but also to improve the aesthetics of that building. We do have some money left in the MWRD uh, fund balance to cover this cost. So um, we thought that would be a good use and a good location. Have not thought about what that mural will look like, what it will include, who will do it. Um, we just put in a guesstimate amount of money in there and to have a conversation if it is included in the final um, budget. That being said, I would like to see each year to recommend some type of public art piece each year for the community in different parts and different formats and we can talk about how how and what ideas we can incorporate there. Great. Thoughts on that? Like that idea? Don't like that idea? I, I, I want a, an art committee, you know, I'm all for it. I'm just wondering, I'm thinking, it's still sticking in my head that only 7% of our streets is what we're looking at to do. And, and this, is, this, is, it, this is in the sports complex fund, so it's not in the street fund. Okay, and, but it's MWRD funds? No, it's or? not MFT funds, it's okay. in the MWRD sports complex okay. fund. It's that. in that fund for that. I just, I'm, I'm just thinking about it. I, what I'm getting at, the one that, everything that we've covered, I'm still thinking about our streets. And so when I see money like this for a mural that we will have to maintain and repair, I do kind of worry. On the other side, I'm somebody that loves the arts and I would love to have an art and culture committee and, and do all these wonderful things. So that's I, just where I'm at. I'm not saying yeah. no, I'm just thinking, I'm still st stuck on how only 7% of our streets is what we're looking at yeah. right now. Um, the other thing is, is that we did have conversations because I didn't like the way the building looked and I did come back and say, what's going on? And, and you know, this is something that the expectation is that the baseball group maintain that building, but they're just not able to. They don't have the funds to do it. And so I think in the end, if we're gonna have events out there and we're gonna want it to look good, we're gonna end up putting money into it anyway. TJ? Yes. <laughs> so our, um, so even painting it and putting up new siding and all of that is going to cost, is going to have a cost and that's the fund that's going to come from. So this is an opportunity to add some public art in a place with the funds that we have to paint. Instead of painting it all blue, it's painting it with some, some something um, with some culture and and something that's going to add some value. And, and I know that there's a lot of streets that need to be done and we're putting a significant um, <coughs> amount of money into the streets, but it can't all go into the streets. And I, I that it's my recommendation in the end, um, it's up to the board. And if I could just comment on that very much up to what Juliana's point right there is with streets in particular, it is very much a marathon and not a sprint. So you pick a level of service and you adhere to that level of service, if not in perpetuity for a generation. And then future generations will get all of the benefit of that. So. And they can only take on so many streets each year because <laughs> they have to be well. engineered and monitored and. Right, and, and I get that. I'm just yeah. saying we're putting a mural on. And so every year we're gonna have to upkeep it. Is it gonna change? I mean, what's. No, the intent is not that it changes. Yes, we may have to maintain it if it peels in some area or whatever. In five years, it may need touching up. And how much does it cost to just paint it blue? I don't know. I don't think that <clears throat> does a lot for that area. So maybe we can talk about the, the price difference between just, I guess, repainting it and versus the, the public art. Maybe something we can explore. And again, if it's not a mural and it's a piece of sculpture or it's something else, the, we, you know, we, we put the piece of sculpture out in front of uh, Village Hall. We have the fountain in the plaza. Uh, we've tried to do some seating areas in different parts of town where there are some gathering places. All of those 
sense of place things make a community and they um, make it livable and people to have a desire to to want to feel at home and be there and and um, so I think they're important now it might not be a mural it might be a piece of art or or something else would be the preference of the board we can look at that we're trying to meet two needs at the same time we'll get a start somewhere and so I appreciate the initiative um, go ahead moving on all right uh, the next item is on also on page 16 the next two uh, the sports complex improvements we have a DCEO grant for 1.5 million dollars to make improvements this will be the final phase of improvements to the sports complex uh, it's been many years in the coming uh, the next are miscellaneous improvements for the sports complex every year we identify it the roadway could need work uh, it could be that we have signs that are damaged it could be that we have planting beds that need new plant material in them. Um, as, as the owners or the uh, leaseholders of that property, we're going to every year have items that need to be improved. In, in the uh, sports complex improvements, that's for the uh, 1.5 to 3 million? Yes, sir. Has there been any talk, any consideration about uh, adding a lighting to the gazebo uh, so that the Productions that we put on there at the uh, venue um, won't be forced to curtail, and maybe it's by design we don't want to light because we want people out of there. If that's the case, then it's another story. But sometimes, as I've noticed, that it starts to get dark, or as sunset comes in and there's no lighting on that stage, um, that it becomes uh, a little hard to see the acts and the people that are performing. Yes, there is not stage lighting. Uh, if we were, stage lighting wasn't built in as part of that. That would be something that would be brought in per act, per event. It would be very hard to maintain it effectively out there. Um, also, we also want to stay good neighbors because um, there are homes that are immediately adjacent to that area. So I know the original intent at least was that pretty much events would, not entirely, but they would be winding down at sunset. Yeah, and, and the reason I say that is that we're working sorry it's part of the improvements you know that we're working on you know uh, is that a consideration uh, it has not been part of the design to date um, and what I would probably recommend with that is the number of events we have out there is relatively small it's five or six events a year that we bring lighting out to that site rental lighting that's readily available rather than permanent installation lighting but heretofore we haven't done the rental lighting so that's something we, we can consider moving forward yes okay Good consideration. Thanks. Moving on. All right. Uh, the next items are, well, we're going to go through a couple of different things here, but um, on page 42, we're going to begin with the vehicle replacements for next year. Um, first item on page 42 is a one-ton dump. Um, the next is a cargo van and as well as a pickup truck for next year. Uh, in the police department, this is on page 41 now, uh, we'll be doing our annual complement of four uh, replacement squad cars, which is what we do every year. Then if you notice adjacent to that, there is also a uh, replacement of a police SUV. And then right below that, we have it line item separately now. We have what are called squad accessories. So when a vehicle comes in, um, it's vehicle plus labor plus accessories equals squad car. Uh, so they come in relatively bare. Uh, we then turn them into squad cars. But until Ford sticks with a consistent design for at least the next couple of years, we're going to continue to have to buy accessories for the squad cars. 
Now, if Ford sticks with a design, so for example, the Crown Victoria, if any of you are car buffs and might remember the Crown Vic, that stayed for many, many, many years. We didn't have to buy nearly as many accessories. Ford seems to be changing the model quite regularly now, so this is something that'll probably continue. On the squad cars, what's the life expectancy uh, of <coughs> cars in service? Well, that varies. Um, so the car will get three years frontline service. That will be as a squad car. Uh, then after three years, it will move into a secondary capacity. Oftentimes that's still in the police department. It could become a code enforcement, a traffic enforcement car. It could become one of those. It could also move in and become a pool car uh, for any of the other departments uh, that need a vehicle. So for example, the engineering department regularly uses pool cars, what we refer to as pool cars or the 3000 fleet. So it, it's probably going to be in our possession for I'll say eight to 10 years. Sometimes it gets a little longer than that. We just got rid of our last Crown Vic a couple of years ago. That car has probably been around 13 or 14 years. Um, it just depends on each individual car and what we think it's gonna get on the used market as we're moving the cars through the system. And my thinking behind that is, in, in, as you probably can anticipate, uh, <laughs> is that with the introduction of electric vehicles uh, and many of these uh, companies, Ford and some others have even announced that uh, they plan to go to all electric production in the very near term, in the very short future, uh, they'll be doing all electric vehicles in terms of production. How have we factored in the fact that, you know, we're looking at cars that we're looking at maybe a 10 year lifespan, uh, but in the meantime, electric vehicles are coming on hard and fast. And as we start investing money into the old gas powered vehicles, when will we start seeing the transition to the electric vehicles? And I know some of the concerns about electric vehicles for police cars and uh, battery life and, and, and some of those type of things and uh, range and, and, and so forth. But is uh, that a consideration you know, for electric vehicles uh, and making that transition? Is that part of our uh, e evaluation? Yes, sir. Um, so <clears throat> As of right now, Ford has introduced a hybrid electric, hybrid, so it's still gas yes. powered partially. Yes. They've introduced a hybrid electric um, uh, police interceptor, or uh, police SUV, I believe they call them now. Um, this was the first model year that they were available. I know they've had challenges with them. Um, Rob and I are, Rob Loth, the fleet supervisor and I, are reviewing whether we're going to bring them in as part of next year's program, okay. or if they're gonna be the following year's program. I know Ford is working on um, correcting some of these issues that they have. They're always gonna have a first year issue, so if you don't get hung yeah. up about that, just don't buy in the first year. Right. Um, we know we're working on them. We will either bring them on in this coming year in 22 or in the 23 model year we suspect we're gonna start incorporating hybrids. Uh, there is nothing on the, these are 24 hour vehicles, particularly in our um, police vehicles, these are 24 hour vehicles. As of right now, without a very large expansion of our fleet, uh, we probably, we, I don't anticipate in the near future moving to all electric vehicles unless they can come up with a charging regimen that will charge them very, very quickly. Um, because it's not just mile time, as it would be if you, if you talk about electric cars, you're usually talking about mile time. It's mile time and idle time, and we put a lot of extra equipment. So every radio might be five watts radio, might be two watts or one watt when it's receiving, it might be five watts when it's transmitting, that all contributes to battery takeage. So it's something we're paying very close attention to, uh, as of right now, I see us moving into hybrids in the, I'm gonna say the near future. I think all electrics are a little, are a little farther on. Uh, I think Ford wanting to go to an all electric fleet, I suspect, although I haven't read it, that there's an asterisk next to that where it says, except for something, 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 that probably includes public, public safety. Sure. We'll get there. Um, I think we're a little bit away from all electric. Uh, so the next item are the uh, 
well, under the highlight of trailers, but uh, we have a chipper coming next year for 61,000, a backhoe for 151 or 115,000, these are on page 43, and a forklift uh, for 17,300. So the next item I would like to direct you to, and I, I don't know if Schuber is gonna do some of these. Schuber, are you gonna do the TIFFs? Yes. Okay, well then I might be done. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple items up here for me, so I'll, I'll let me just do those real quick, Schubert, and then I'll transition to you. Um, so in TIF number three, uh, which is the Ontario, what, well, what I refer to as the Ontarioville TIF. What page? Uh, what page? I'm sorry, uh, page 17. Okay. Uh, we have on page 17 uh, additional banners for the Ontarioville district. Um, to swap out the banners that we currently have so we could have banner change outs throughout the year rather than having one banner year round. We also have some additional holiday decorations. Uh, I think over time we'll probably end up doing as decorations in there similar to what we do um, in other parts of town. And that's it for me. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alright, <laughs> so my items are all um, TIF items, which means that all of the funding for these capital items are coming from uh, TIF funds, not from the general fund. Uh, so with that, the first item is page 17, which is land acquisition. And the recommendation here is to set aside money, uh, 250,000 for land acquisition. So as you know, uh, we have the village center plan and as that gets implemented, we might come across an area that may be strategically valuable for the village to acquire property for a good public purpose. And a good example of that would be um, the village center plaza for instance, that was a privately owned property. We had set money aside for property acquisition a few years ago, um, thinking about another property that we had thought would come on the market for another purpose. But as uh, five properties owned by um, this individual came up uh, for acquisition, they were in a very strategic location and, and we were able to use those funds. So with that in mind, as we move forward with the implementation of the village center plan, uh, setting aside that money uh, for that purpose. Uh, there are new roadway connections, there is uh, public purpose use, and then sometimes um, we are able to acquire uh, delinquent properties, for instance, at a good uh, price that may be available only for a municipality and not for, a pri for the private sector too. So um, having those funds set aside uh, is the purpose here. Uh, the next line item. Uh, Real, uh, Shubra? Yes. So it's setting it aside should should those properties come about. Um, are, you, are you talking, to, like I'm looking at Ontarioville Road, like those apartment complexes there? No. No, so this is, so uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our, uh, village center plans showed um, a roadway connection connecting two different streets. We may have to acquire property for that purpose. Okay. Or they, there are a couple of properties, and I'm just using these as mm -hmm, examples, mm -hmm. um, just found out that there are a couple of properties on Devon Avenue uh, that are currently delinquent. Um, and it may make sense for us to acquire those um, similarly, when the Merrick House became available, we were able to use TIF funds. Um, actually, we were able to acquire that for at no cost. But um, if a strategic property becomes available for a civic purpose, 
uh, these funds would be able to use. We may decide in the future to return them back to uh, the private sector. Sometimes there are properties that become available where um, it, it may become an impediment if we did not acquire it, uh, or we may be able to use it uh, to help a larger development. So just setting aside that proactively uh, for that purpose. The next item I have is a facade improvement grant, uh, page 18. And you would see a similar theme for all three TIFs. But the grant uh, really is to, <coughs> as we implement the streetscape project, um, and next year we are hoping to also issue an RFP to develop the South commuter lot. Um, we are trying to really uplift and upgrade uh, the physical aspect, the aesthetic aspect of our TIF 3, the Village Center TIF, and in order to help the existing properties there, give them an incentive to also invest uh, money um, into improving their own private properties. Uh, facade improvement and streetscape improvement grants are very commonly used as a tool in several municipalities where um, uh, say it could, and we will develop criteria, we will bring that to you, um, but it could be say, for example, up to 50% of the cost of these eligible items uh, could be reimbursed. It could be a reimbursement grant where the improvements first have to be designed, approved by the village using these criteria and can be only used for these items um, and once they are installed and inspected, then they get uh, reimbursed for that money. How do, how do we determine the $50,000 amount? Is that what's available in the TIF for, for that use, or is that uh, based on some other criteria? So for TIF 3, uh, the recommendation is 100000 And yes, we do have that much money available in TIF 3. What about TIF 4? For TIF 4, four uh, same thing, because we finally have that much money in the TIF now. Okay, so it's availability within Only, the TIF. Right. Okay. Until now, TIFs four and five were upside down. So there was no increment that was positive. Uh, but this year onwards, we're hoping that it'll continue to stay positive. And it, it, this is something that we will have to bring back to you year after year. Or um, you know, if we didn't use the money, then that money would be still available. But it could be a first come, first serve. It could be a priority. Uh, for TIF 3, we are hoping that properties along Devon Avenue, Church Road, Ontarioville, those are the ones that really need the help and the little bit of a push as an incentive for private sector um, investment as well. Uh, same uh, grant for uh, TIF 4 uh, is on page 19. And this is where um, IDOT is also planning improvements at the intersection of Irving Park Road and Barrington Road. And there are several properties in TIF 4 uh, that are tired and need some help. Uh, the newly occupied Italian Express, now it is Taco Express. There's Chapala, there is the vacant Yummy Station. There's quite a few properties in that area, the uh, vacant LA 10 building. Isn't Legend Wings going in the yummy space? Legend Wings is wanting to go in. They still don't have all of their approvals in. Okay. But if you look at the parking lot, if you look at the exterior of that property, especially Chapala, yeah. uh, it could need some oh, help. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. uh, it, it's an incentive when the property owner knows that there could be some assistance if I made the investment. Uh, it stretches their dollar further too. Okay. Plus it gives us control about the design. So if we don't want to see uh, them paint a building purple, you, you could have a say in it. Uh, and that area behind LA 10 is village property. It is village property. And it's a disaster. <laughs> and we have already talked to the property owners that if they could bring us uh, a concept that the village would like to see in terms of development, um, we would work with them. Every time I go through the drive through at the Donut Place, I look at that and I, I'm not going to say what I feel like doing. But anyway, I want 
few. So, fifty thousand. The goal is to have those properties uh, expanded into that area and to have those. That's why the village. That was one of on the no yeah. cash bid that we require acquired, acquired that at no cost in the hopes to attach it to another piece of property. <clears throat> it just is much more slow going than we thought. And it's probably costing us a little bit in maintenance, but would really? be good. <laughs> <laughs> would like to turn that over that. to the want, private sector. You don't want it. Let's not go there. <laughs> continue that one. Okay. Number five. Um, TIF 5 is the area uh, 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 including the old Salem Shopping Center, for instance, uh, the vacant Long John Silver's building, the other little shopping center at Orchard and Irving Park. All of those properties are, again, properties that need some help and uh, would benefit from a facade improvement. Uh, the one thing that when, when we bring that to you in terms of criteria, uh, we would make sure that the funds are used for uh, something that would be a public benefit, which means not to pay for, um, say, property maintenance, deferred property maintenance. That's not the intent here. Uh, it is to go a little bit above and beyond what a property owner should be doing anyway. So we will bring that to you in terms of criteria. Uh, about 30,000 is what to five currently has, so that is what is in the budget uh, at this time for that. I think that is all that I had. Thank, thank you. Thank if you. If we wanted to make significant improvements in some of those facades, could we supplement what's in the tip uh, with with village funds? I mean, in order to really bring those up to speed, because it doesn't seem like thirty thousand would go too far. In, in accomplishing the goal. So would we need to to add to that uh, a, some portion of village funds in order to, well, you know, t it, to, to make it work, work the while? It depends on what um, level of improvements we want to see as a village. If it goes above and beyond just the um, facade, then it may need some, but yes, uh, uh, typically, um, there are other, and, and we've been researching what other municipalities do. There are, the, it, it ranges from a minimum of 10,000 to even 150,000 per property. Um, and it would be up to the village board to set a maximum, whether it is based on frontage, whether it is based on square footage, whether it is based on per property, um, a maximum of whatever amount, and usually it is first come first serve. So it's not that all of the properties would be done in that first year, it could, it could be that the entire 30,000 is available only to one property, if there is only one application. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I like the allocation of 50%, you know, the, the separation or the division of 50% yeah. uh, from the it's TIF. They're skin in the game too. And then too. the yeah. property mm -hmm. owner. I think that's, you know, that's a, a good formula. Yeah. to follow. I just want to make sure that if we do it, that there's adequate funding to ma really make a difference. Right. You're right. Yeah. If, <laughs> you, you're going to get me joking here. And uh, for the village to add funds to the tip, we would have somebody like Menards that had an underwater tip look for the village to reimburse them in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So. We create the tip to generate the dollars and to share that. So I wouldn't be, um, I don't think we should be trying to add dollars to the tip unless it was in a loan program, but we don't want to do that with a tip. I don't, and see this, well, I, I don't know what the ac actual, um, what the actual uh, details are of it, but I'm just saying that if we took 30,000 from the tip could we then not put it in the TIF, but add some type of business development grant to accompany the TIF so that we could accomplish that goal with an adequate amount to achieve the stated purpose? So I'm not saying put money in the TIF. I would never recommend that. But we would take the 30 from the TIF and then maybe add another 30 from the village. And now we've got $60,000. So in Old Salem, 
we could have a uniform facade improvement across that whole plaza where everything is uniform and is done consistently mm -hmm. to give it an updated and modernized look because I don't think 30,000 would accomplish it. Maybe it would, but if, it, if it's inadequate to accomplish the goal, then are we just spinning our wheels by saying we're gonna give $30,000 to do a facade improvement when it's not gonna achieve anything? Or accomplish the, the purpose? I'm, I'm optimistic with Old Salem being up for sale. I don't know if there's a buyer. Actually there is, yeah. There, there is. It's, it's currently so there, under contract. A, a nice revenue shift on that. And so I think uh, for the longer Hopefully term, the not necessarily tomorrow, but yeah. you're going to see some revenue in that too. Hope so. Jump up. So we'll okay. see. I, it's a good idea, Herb, when you talk about business initiatives or business yeah. grants. There's always, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, there are some communities that do a revolving loan program. There are some that do a business assistance grant. Uh, Th those can be done separately, right. and then those are not restricted just to TIF districts. Right. For instance, the area along Irving Park Road west of Barrington is not in a TIF, but there are many, many shopping centers there uh, with many small businesses that could probably also benefit from some improvement. Absolutely. But that is something that, something totally different yeah. that we okay. would need to put Thank together. You. So the tip is complete. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a motion and a second from the left. All in favor on the right. Oh. Can I take off? Christy, would you take the <laughs> yes. roll, please? Uh, Trustee Prigge. Yes. Trustee Husani. Yes. Trustee Gutierrez. Yes. Trustee Porter. Yes. Trustee Bancoli. Yes. We are done Thank you, staff, for your good work and presentation.